Nicholas II, the eldest son of Emperor Alexander III and Empress Maria Fyodorovna was born 18 May 1868 in Tsarsko Silo, near St. Petersburg. As heir apparent, the young Nicholas received an excellent palace education that prepared him for his future role as autocrat of all the Russias. Among the young Tsarevich's private tutors were the ultra-conservative Ober-Procurator of the Holy Synod and former advisor to Alexander III, Konstantin Petrovich Pobedonostsev, and General Grigory Danilovich. Partially due to their efforts, Nicholas's character combined extraordinary restraint to the point of shyness, love of military service and of all things military, and the sacred belief in the inviolability of the principles of absolute autocracy, traits which to a greater or lesser degree later affected his activities as Tsar. Contemporaries unanimously note Nicholas's great personal charm, his quiet restraint, combined with an ability to converse easily with others, and his excellent memory which allowed him to recall an enormous number of people whom he had met over the years. He spoke and wrote fluent English, and communicated in this language with his wife, who as child spent her summers at the court of her grandmother, Queen Victoria, and also knew French and German. The emperor was fond of history and was an avid reader of both entertaining and scholarly books. In addition, Nicholas was fascinated by photography, as were his children, and he enjoyed both walking and hunting, as did many other Romanovs. When automobiles appeared in Russia, they captivated him, and the Russian court possessed one of the largest car collections in early 20th century Europe. Nicholas II came to power unexpectedly, after Alexander III died suddenly from kidney failure in Lavidia Palace on the Black Sea at the age of 49. At the time of this tragedy, Nicholas was engaged to Princess Alice from the small German state of Hesse. Despite the time-honored tradition of holding mourning for one year after the death of a monarch, Nicholas decided to get married immediately, and thus the young couple's honeymoon was spent in an atmosphere of mourning. The coronation of Nicholas and Alexandra, as she was called after her conversion to Orthodoxy, was opulent, but the festivities for the common folk in Kodinsko Field on the outskirts of Moscow ended tragically. Rumors that the free beer and pretzels would not suffice for the huge crowd that had gathered resulted in a stampede in which almost 1,400 people were trampled to death. The tragedy became known as the Kodinka, and was considered by many to be a bad omen for the new regime. Once in power, Nicholas immediately made known his position about the impossibility of constitutional reform and the inviolability of the autocracy. This pleased the country's monarchists, but disappointed the liberal intelligentsia and the educated elite. As a whole, the Russian economy expanded during Nicholas II's reign. This economic growth permitted the currency reform of 1897 which established the gold standard for the ruble. On the eve of World War I, in 1913, the country's highest level of economic development was reached, so that the later successes of the USSR were purposely compared with this year. The rate of industrial growth at this time was 4 to 4.5%, whereas agricultural growth was 2.0%. The construction of railroads continued, natural resources, such as oil in Baku and in Grozny, were actively exploited. The conditions of factory workers improved somewhat during Nicholas's reign, but this did not result in a decrease in the number of strikes, especially during the 1905-1907 revolution. In the sphere of foreign policy, Nicholas strengthened Russia's focus on an alliance with France, and later with England, the Triple Alliance or Entente. Despite once friendly relations with Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, Nicholas and Wilhelm were cousins, the relationship between the two countries began to chill. Russia concluded a treaty with China, which allowed it to build railroads in Manchuria, and then to rent two ports on the coast of China, one of them Port Arthur, for 25 years. Strengthening Russia's position in the Far East led to the disastrous war with Japan in 1904-1905. As a result of underestimating the enemy, inadequate technical equipment in the army and the navy, extended lines of communication, and occasional lack of strong leadership in the army, the war ended in a catastrophe for Russia, the nadir of which was the destruction of the Russian fleet in the naval battle of Tsushima. President Theodore Roosevelt negotiated the peace treaty which was signed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1905. This destabilizing war with its disgraceful defeat was one of the causes leading to the revolution of 1905-1907. 
Riots began after what became known as Bloody Sunday, when on the 22nd of January 1905, a peaceful crowd of factory workers and their families, carrying icons and singing hymns marched towards Palace Square from several points in the city. They were fired upon by soldiers of the Imperial Guard, and some 40 people were killed. Nicholas was not in residence at the time, but the marching demonstrators were unaware of this fact, and he received the blame for the massacre. Although several authors have claimed that there may well have been agents provocateurs mixed in with the marching workers, society at large viewed the brutal suppression of this event as the execution of peaceful citizens. The capital city and the country at large were beset by worker uprisings and clashes with the police, and overall unrest increased. In October of 1905, under great pressure from ever-worsening circumstances and general strikes, Nicholas was forced to relinquish his iron grip on his autocratic principles and to grant civil liberties and the convening of an elective, legislative body, the State Duma. Meanwhile, in December 1905 in Moscow, an armed workers' uprising flared up, but the unrest soon waned. Nicholas's relationship with the Duma, was, unsurprisingly, not of the warmest nature, and the unruly Duma was twice dissolved by the Tsar. Only after the tightening of election laws was a more docile Duma elected that proved capable of working with the Tsarist government. With the Duma's participation, the progressive economic reforms of Prime Minister Peter Stolypin were implemented, but unfortunately Stolypin was assassinated by terrorists in the Kiev Theater in 1911, during a performance at which Nicholas himself was also in attendance. Once again, another hope for peaceful reforms in Russia was extinguished. As has already been mentioned, Nicholas II was a controversial figure who evoked love and respect from some of his contemporaries, but disapproval from others. He was an exemplary family man who deeply loved his wife, the Empress Alexandra. Contemporaries confirmed that the Emperor avoided social events and tried to spend as much time as possible in the circle of his close family. The couple had four girls, Olga, Tatiana, Maria and Anastasia, before the longed-for son, Alexei, finally appeared in 1904. The great joy at the birth of an heir turned into horror shortly thereafter at the discovery that the young child was stricken with hemophilia, a potentially lethal disease in which the blood does not clot. Although stringent steps were implemented to protect the boy's fragile life, it was impossible to prevent all injuries, and in those desperate cases, with the doctors unable to alleviate the boy's excruciating pain and the Tsar's incredible wealth incapable of purchasing a cure, a terrified Alexandra grasped at other means to save the life of her beloved son. Thus the magnetic Siberian mystic, Rasputin, was able to rise to prominence. To this day, no satisfactory explanation has been found as to how Rasputin worked his cures, but work them he did, and Alexandra trusted him implicitly as the only person capable of helping her pain-racked son. Thus, the mangy mystic gained enormous influence over the devout Alexandra, and threw her over the Emperor of Russia, all of which only further destabilized the country that was suddenly plunged into a war of worldwide dimensions. The First World War shocked contemporaries with its brutality and simultaneously, demonstrated the weakness of certain elements of the Russian economy. If, at the declaration of war in 1914, thousands of citizens enthusiastically cheered Nicholas II on Petersburg's Palace Square, only two years later the popularity of the war among society at large had plummeted. Nicholas's decision to take upon himself the duties of the Supreme Commander and his departure from St. Petersburg to headquarters at the front caused him to lose control over the situation in the capital. The active participation of the Empress, a German by birth, in the running of the government, led to outrageous rumors that resulted in a further weakening of the power of the autocracy. A disruption in food supplies in Petrograd during the harsh winter of 1916-1917 exacerbated the already deep social divisions and quickly led to riots in the capital, and finally to the February Revolution. In March 1917, Nicholas abdicated in both his name and the name of his underage son, the Tsarevich Alexei. It was assumed that power would pass to his brother, Grand Duke Mikhail, but he refused to accept the crown. The convening of a constituent assembly to determine the country's future form of government was announced for the end of 1917, and in the meantime, power passed to the provisional government, which consisted of eminent personalities from the state Duma. However, before the constituent assembly could be convened, the Bolsheviks had already seized power in the country. 
The French government declined to accept the Romanovs in view of increasing unrest on the Western Front and on the Home Front as a result of the ongoing war with Germany. The British ambassador in Paris, Lord Francis Bertie, advised the Foreign Secretary that the Romanovs would be unwelcome in France as the ex-Empress was regarded as pro-German. Even if an offer of asylum had been forthcoming, there would have been other obstacles to be overcome. The provisional government only remained in power through an uneasy alliance with the Petrograd Soviet, an arrangement known as the dual power. An initial plan to send the royal family to the northern port of Murmansk had to be abandoned when it was realized that the railway workers and the soldiers guarding them were loyal to the Petrograd Soviet, which opposed the escape of the Tsar. A later proposal to send the Romanovs to a neutral port in the Baltic Sea via the Duchy of Finland faced similar difficulties. On 20 March 1917, the provisional government decreed that the royal family should be held under house arrest in the Alexander Palace at Tsarskoy Silo. Nicholas joined the rest of the family there two days later, having traveled from the wartime headquarters at Mogilev. The family had total privacy inside the palace, but walks in the grounds were strictly regulated. Members of their domestic staff were allowed to stay if they wished and culinary standards were maintained. Colonel Eugene Kabilinsky was appointed to command the military garrison at Tsarskoy Silo, which increasingly had to be done through negotiation with the committees or Soviets elected by the soldiers. That summer, the failure of the Kerensky offensive against Austro-Hungarian and German forces in Galicia led to anti-government rioting in Petrograd, known as the July Days. The government feared that further disturbances in the city could easily reach Tsarskoy Silo and it was decided to move the royal family to a safer location. Alexander Kerensky, who had taken over as prime minister, selected the town of Tobolsh in western Siberia, since it was remote from any large city and 150 miles from the nearest rail station. Some sources state that there was an intention to send the family abroad in the spring of 1918 via Japan, but more recent work suggests that this was just a Bolshevik rumor. The family left the Alexander Palace late on 13 August, reached two men by rail four days later and then by two river ferries finally reached Tobolsh on 19 August. There they lived in the former governor's mansion in considerable comfort. In October 1917, however, the Bolsheviks seized power from Kerensky's provisional government. Nicholas followed the events in October with interest but not yet with alarm. Boris Soloviev, the husband of Maria Rasputin, attempted to organize a rescue with monarchical factions, but it came to nothing. Rumors persist that Soloviev was working for the Bolsheviks or the Germans, or both. Separate preparations for a rescue by Nikolai Yevgenievich Markov were frustrated by Soloviev's ineffectual activities. Nicholas continued to underestimate Lenin's importance. In the meantime he and his family occupied themselves with reading books, exercising and playing games, Nicholas particularly enjoyed chopping firewood. However, in January 1918, the Guard Detachment's committee grew more assertive, restricting the hours that the family could spend in the grounds and banning them from walking to church on a Sunday as they had done since October. In a later incident, the soldiers tore the epaulets from Kabilinsky's uniform, and he asked Nicholas not to wear his uniform outside for fear of provoking a similar event. In February 1918, the Council of People's Commissars, abbreviated to Sovnarkom in Moscow, the new capital, announced that the state subsidy for the family would be drastically reduced, starting on 1 March. This meant parting with 12 devoted servants and giving up butter and coffee as luxuries, even though Nicholas added to the funds from his own resources. Nicholas and Alexandra were appalled by news of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, whereby Russia agreed to give up Poland, Finland, the Baltic states, most of Belarus, Ukraine, the Crimea, most of the Caucasus, and small parts of Russia proper including areas around Peskov and Rostov-on-Don. What kept the family's spirits up was the belief that help was at hand. The Romanovs believed that various plots were underway to break them out of captivity and smuggle them to safety. The Western Allies lost interest in the fate of the Romanovs after Russia left the war. The German government wanted the monarchy restored in Russia to crush the Bolsheviks and maintain good relations with the Central Powers. The situation in Tobolsh changed for the worse on 26 March, when 250 ill-disciplined Red Guards arrived from the regional capital, Omsk. Not to be outdone, the Soviet in Yekaterinburg, the capital of the neighboring Ural region, sent 400 Red Guards to exert their influence on the town. 
Disturbances between these rival groups and the lack of funds to pay the Guard Detachment caused them to send a delegation to Moscow to plead their case. The result was that Sovnarkom appointed their own commissar to take charge of Tabalsh and remove the Romanovs to Yekaterinburg, with the intention of eventually bringing Nicholas to a show trial in Moscow. The man selected was Vasily Yakovlev, a veteran Bolshevik, recruiting a body of loyal men en route. Yakovlev arrived in Tabalsh on the 22nd of April. He imposed his authority on the competing Red Guards factions, paid off and demobilized the Guard detachment, and placed further restrictions on the Romanovs. The next day, Yakovlev informed Kabilinsky that Nicholas was to be transferred to Yekaterinburg. Alexei was too ill to travel, so Alexandra elected to go with Nicholas along with Maria, while the other daughters would remain at Tabalsh until they were able to make the journey. At 3 a.m. on 25 April, the three Romanovs, their retinue, and the escort of Yakovlev's detachment, left Tabalsh in a convoy of 19 Tarantasses, four-wheeled carriages, as the river was still partly frozen which prevented the use of the ferry. After an arduous journey which included two overnight stops, fording rivers, frequent changes of horses and a foiled plot by the Yekaterinburg Red Guards to abduct and kill the prisoners, the party arrived at two men and boarded a requisition train. Yakovlev was able to communicate securely with Moscow by means of a Hughes teleprinter and obtained agreement to change their destination to Omsk, where it was thought that the leadership were less likely to harm the Romanovs. Leaving two men early on 28 April, the train left towards Yekaterinburg, but quickly changed direction towards Omsk. This led the Yekaterinburg leaders to believe that Yakovlev was a traitor who was trying to take Nicholas to exile by way of Vladivostok. Telegraph messages were sent, 2,000 armed men were mobilized and a train was dispatched to arrest Yakovlev and the Romanovs. The Romanovs' train was halted at Omsk station and after a frantic exchange of cables with Moscow, it was agreed that they should go to Yekaterinburg in return for a guarantee of safety for the royal family. They finally arrived there on the morning of 30 April. They were imprisoned in the two-story Ipadiev house, the home of the military engineer Nikolai Nikolaevich Ipadiev, which ominously became referred to as the House of Special Purpose. Here the Romanovs were kept under even stricter conditions, their retinue was further reduced and their possessions were searched. Following allegations of pilfering from the royal household, Yakov Yurovsky, a former member of the Cheka secret police, was appointed to command the guard detachment, a number of whom were replaced with trusted Latvian members of the Yekaterinburg Special Service Detachment. The remaining Romanovs left Tobolsk by river steamer on 20 May and arrived in Yekaterinburg three days later. By the first weeks of June, the Bolsheviks were becoming alarmed by the revolt of the Czechoslovak Legion, whose forces were approaching the city from the east. This prompted a wave of executions and murders of those in the region who were believed to be counter-revolutionaries, including Grand Duke Michael, who was murdered in Perm on 13 June. Although the Bolshevik leadership in Moscow still intended to bring Nicholas to trial, as the military situation deteriorated, Leon Trotsky and Yakov Sverdlov began to publicly equivocate about the possible fate of the former Tsar. On 16 July, the Yekaterinburg leadership informed Yurovsky that it had been decided to execute the Romanovs as soon as approval arrived from Moscow, because the Czechs were expected to reach the city imminently. A coded telegram arrived in Moscow from Yekaterinburg that evening, after Lenin and Sverdlov had conferred a reply was sent, although no trace of that document has ever been found. In the meantime, Yurovsky had organized his firing squad and they waited through the night at the Ipadiev house for the signal to act. There are several accounts of what happened and historians have not agreed on a solid, confirmed scope of events. According to the account of Bolshevik officer Yakov Yurovsky, the chief executioner, in the early hours of 17 July 1918, the royal family was awakened around 2 a.m., got dressed, and were led down into a half-basement room at the back of the Ipadiev house. The pretext for this move was the family's safety, i.e. that anti-Bolshevik forces were approaching Yekaterinburg, and the house might be fired upon. Present with Nicholas, Alexandra and their children were their doctor and three of their servants, who had voluntarily chosen to remain with the family, the Tsar's personal physician Eugene Botkin, his wife's maid Anna Demidova, and the family's chef, Ivan Haritonov, and footman, Alexei Trupp. A firing squad had been assembled and was waiting in an adjoining room, composed of seven communist soldiers from Central Europe, and three local Bolsheviks, all under the command of Yurovsky. Nicholas was carrying his son. 
When the family arrived in the basement, the former Tsar asked if chairs could be brought in for his wife and son to sit on. Yurovsky ordered two chairs brought in, and when the Empress and the heir were seated, the executioners filed into the room. Yurovsky announced to them that the Ural Soviet of workers' deputies had decided to execute them. A stunned Nicholas asked, what? What did you say? And turned toward his family. Yurovsky quickly repeated the order and Nicholas said, according to Peter Yermakov, you know not what you do. The executioners drew handguns and began shooting, Nicholas was the first to die. Yurovsky took credit afterwards for firing the first shot that killed the Tsar, but his protege, Grigory Nikolin, said years later that Mikhail Medvedev had fired the shot that killed Nicholas. He fired the first shot. He killed the Tsar, he said in 1964 in a tape-recorded statement for the radio. Nicholas was shot several times in the chest, sometimes erroneously said to have been shot in his head, but his skull bore no bullet wounds when it was discovered in 1991. Anastasia, Tatiana, Olga, and Maria survived the first hail of bullets, the sisters were wearing over 1.3 kilograms of diamonds and precious gems sewn into their clothing, which provided some initial protection from the bullets and bayonets. They were then stabbed with bayonets and finally shot at close range in their heads. An announcement from the Presidium of the Ural Regional Soviet of the Workers' and Peasants' Government emphasized that conspiracies had been exposed to free the ex-Tsar, that counter-revolutionary forces were pressing in on Soviet Russian territory, and that the ex-Tsar was guilty of unforgivable crimes against the nation. The bodies were driven to nearby woodland, searched and burned. The remains were soaked in acid and finally thrown down a disused mineshaft. On the following day, other members of the Romanov family including Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna, the Empress's sister, who were being held in a school at Olopiesk, were taken to another mine shaft and thrown in alive, except for Grand Duke Sergei Mikhailovich who was shot when he tried to resist. In 1979, the bodies of Tsar Nicholas II, Tsaritsa Alexandra, three of their daughters, and those of four non-family members killed with them, were discovered near Sverdlovsk, Yekaterinburg, by amateur archaeologist Alexander Avdonin. In January 1998, the remains excavated from underneath the dirt road near Yekaterinburg were officially identified as those of Nicholas II and his family, excluding one daughter, either Maria or Anastasia, and Alexei. The identifications, including comparisons to a living relative, performed by separate Russian, British and American scientists using DNA analysis, concur and were found to be conclusive. In July 2007, an amateur historian discovered bones near Yekaterinburg belonging to a boy and young woman. Prosecutors reopened the investigation into the deaths of the imperial family and, in April 2008, DNA tests performed by an American laboratory proved that bone fragments exhumed in the Ural Mountains belonged to two children of Nicholas II, Alexei and a daughter. That same day it was announced by Russian authorities that remains from the entire family had been recovered. On 1 October 2008, the Supreme Court of Russia ruled that Nicholas II and his family were victims of political persecution and should be rehabilitated. In March 2009, results of the DNA testing were published, confirming that the two bodies discovered in 2007 were those of Alexei and one of his sisters. In late 2015, at the insistence of the Russian Orthodox Church, Russian investigators exhumed the bodies of Nicholas II and his wife, Alexandra, for additional DNA testing, which confirmed that the bones were of the couple. After the DNA testing of 1998, the remains of the emperor and his immediate family were interred at St. Peter and Paul Cathedral, St. Petersburg, on 17 July 1998, on the 80th anniversary of their murder. The ceremony was attended by Russian President Boris Yeltsin, who said, Today is a historic day for Russia. For many years, we kept quiet about this monstrous crime, but the truth has to be spoken. The British royal family was represented at the funeral by Prince Michael of Kent, and more than 20 ambassadors to Russia, including Sir Andrew Wood, Archbishop John Bukowski, and Ernst Georg von Studnitz, were also in attendance. In 1981, Nicholas and his immediate family were recognized as martyred saints by the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia. On 14 August 2000, they were recognized by the Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church. This time they were not named as martyrs, since their deaths did not result immediately from their Christian faith, instead, they were canonized as passion bearers.
Now you will hear practically the only recording of the real voice of Nicholas II, which he pronounced at the parade on May 18, 1910. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 